Good afternoon, everyone. Um, sorry for the delay there. My name is Ben Hale. Um, you'll have to work with me a little bit. Um, I am currently nursing uh, three badly bruised ribs and a very bad cold at the moment. Uh, so I might be um, a little slow when you ask your questions, but um, uh, we're gonna talk today about running Java applications on Cloud Foundry. I encourage you to interrupt me um, if you have any questions about the thing that we're actually talking about at the moment. I'll answer if I can quickly, otherwise we'll shift it to um, after the talk. So. Uh, who am I? I am the lead of the Java Cloud, sorry, the Cloud Foundry Java Experience, which is a totally made up title. Uh, but effectively what this means is if you run Java applications on Cloud Foundry, and statistically 85 to 90% of you do, um, it means that you are uh, using a bunch of stuff that my team has worked on, specifically the Java build pack. Uh, so we're going to talk today about exactly how the Java build pack works, the things it can do for you, um, stuff like that. So we always start with the Cloud Foundry haiku from ANSI. Here is my source code. Run it on the cloud for me. I do not care how. It's a very nice saying, um, especially for us on the other side that aren't actually running applications, but creating the platform for you to run applications. But you probably do care how, reasonably. <laughs> it's quite useful. Um, and one of the things I have always loved about Cloud Foundry that attracted me to transfer from um, doing uh, Spring Core development on a day-to-day -day basis to working on Cloud Foundry on a day-to-day -day basis is in most cases, not caring how is a really, really good thing. It increases your velocity because you can trust that someone is guaranteeing that your application will run the way that the platform thinks it should run. All you need to do is make sure you've got an application. But when things go wrong, and absolutely they do, it's really, really helpful to know what's going on. Not because um, it makes you a better developer or anything like that, but primarily it gives you a starting point to diagnose exactly what the problem is. So if we take a look at how a sort of generic build pack works, we have this idea of something called an application. So an application is the bits and pieces that you have pushed to Cloud Foundry. Uh, if you're a node developer, this means basically a bunch of source files and um, an M uh, NPM manifest. If you're um, a Java developer, this actually means a compiled artifact. This means uh, basically we expect you regardless of the fact that we call this thing a build pack, we expect you to have built an artifact, a jar, a war, a zip file, something like that, and push it up. We'll then take it as the build pack. We get involved at that point in something called staging. And staging is responsible for taking your application and adding all the rest of the bits around it that make it run. Things such as a JRE, if you push a war file, something like Tomcat. And the result of that is called a droplet. And a droplet, I don't know who came up with the name, it doesn't particularly tell you anything, but effectively it's a, it's a big tarball, and in one bit of it, it's got all of your files, plus all of the things that the build packs put into your application. And then off to the side, it's got a bunch of metadata, the, the key bit of which is it has a command line that you're actually gonna run. And so that's what we're saying here. Staging is this idea that we take your application and transform it into a droplet using that build pack. And the output there is a bunch of bits and a command line. So the way build packs work, um, and if you don't know this, sort of the build pack concept and the original build pack API was invented by Heroku, in fact. Uh, it predates Cloud Foundry. But we thought, man, this is a really, really good thing. If nothing else, Heroku's got a bunch of these build pack things that will stage a bunch of applications. It's a lot less work that the Cloud Foundry developers actually have to do. So uh, the build pack API is really, really simple. It looks for three files, slash bin, slash detect, slash bin, slash compile, slash bin, slash release, right? And the first one is, uh, should I actually stage the application? It is effectively, given the input application, is some, this something I care about? The Java build pack doesn't care about node files. The node build pack doesn't care about uh, Ruby files, things like that. And so one of the ways that Cloud Foundry is used is when people push an application, they don't say anything. They don't say which build pack is actually gonna run. And so we download all the build packs into the staging container and we offer each one the application um, if they want to do something with it. This is, as you'd expect, a bit less efficient. If you know you're a Java application, probably wise to say, I'd like the Java build pack to use this. We can skip this whole detection phase. The second bit, compile. In a lot of languages, 
Um, except for Java, compile might actually mean something. It might actually mean compiling, right? Um, so I believe the Go build pack will actually compile a Go application during this particular phase. Because we expect the Java application to be pushed up with all of its dependencies having already been compiled um, for performance reasons, we look at this compile phase as the place where we transform the file system for your application. Because it's not sufficient to have, um, and as we saw on this slide right here, the application that we're actually passed is exploded. So when you upload a jar file to us, we explode it onto the file system and we start from there. It's not sufficient to have a directory structure with a bunch of dot classes and dot properties and dot YAML files in it. That's not a, something that's runnable. That's not something we can create a process with. So we have to put things on the file system like a JRE, like a Tomcat or something like that. And then at the end, we have to create a command line. And you might think that running a Java application can be as simple as java-jar or uh, Catalina start or something like that. Uh, oh, no, 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 not in a container. <laughs> uh, that's certainly a very um, naive way that people do it, but we can do better. We try to do better. You almost have to do better than that. And so I apologize for how small this is going to be for the people in the back. Uh, I hope all of you have seen this at some point, um, because what you're looking at is standard staging output for the Java build pack. And so we sit up at the top, and we see the, the build pack kicks out a bunch of information, like which version of the, build, of the Java build pack it is. Um, and it talks about all of the dependencies that it's actually going to download. And it talks about the versions of the dependencies it's going to download. We also kick out how long it took us to go download them and expand them and things like that for a bunch of stuff. So you can sort of think of that first layer, that output, as the compile phase. Here are all the things we're going to do to the file system. And then the release phase kind of corresponds to this insane command line sitting here on the bottom, right? Um, I think the last time we looked sort of the minimum possible command you could run with a Java build pack was like 400 characters long, and it easily gets over six or 700 potentially. But all of that is specific tuning to run Java very, very well in a container on Cloud Foundry. So that bottom bit there, the result of the release phase. So the Java build pack is a bit different from nearly every other build pack that exists out there. Uh, most of the other build packs uh, aim for sort of a very simple um, uh, bit of staging or simple behavior in that they might contribute a node VM. They might take a look at um, uh, your NPM manifest and, and decide what command is going to be run from there or look at a proc file or something like that. The Java build pack has a grander uh, uh, goal. And what we want to do is basically make it so that Java, so that Cloud Foundry is not only the best cloud to run Java, but actually the best place to run Java, period. We want to make it so that when you push an application to Java, you do even less, or sorry, to Cloud Foundry, you do even less work than if you had uh, tried to run this on bare metal locally on your machine. <clears throat> So in order to achieve this kind of, this kind of goal, <clears throat> we had to sort of take a step back and say, OK, it's simple enough to sort of make something that downloads a JRE, and there's only a small number of JREs it could be, put that on the file system, read a proc file somewhere to get a, a command line, and just off you go. We want to do more. We're going to need a bit more of a framework around it. So the build pack sort of takes this idea of detect, release, or detect compile, and release life cycles, and then orthogonally divides them again and says, there are really actually, when we're talking about pushing an application, there are three different components that come into play around that application. The JRE, the container that we're going to run the application with, and then something, sort of a, a catch-all called frameworks. Before we dig into exactly what those are and some examples and the kinds of things they do with you, it is important to notice that almost every integration we have in the Java build pack, whether it's going to get a JRE or Tomcat or integrating with an APM, most of those components, but not all, want to download a dependency of some kind. So we make it really easy. We have a standardized repository format, which is basically an HTTP accessible endpoint. It's got an index inside of it. And then each component decides, I need um, a dependency. I can go find them over here. And I want a specific version. I want the latest and safest version, you might say. And so we have this idea of wildcards. And so if we take a look at an example for um, OpenJDK, again, apologies for the size of this. Um, 
if we take a look over on the left side there, the JRE basically defines a dependency version of 1.8.0 underscore plus, which is basically saying, get me the latest possible version of the Java 8 um, uh, dependency. And it goes and downloads this index thing in the repository, and you see we've got, I don't know, what do you think that is, 30 or 40 different versions of the JRE. It goes ahead and grabs the latest possible version of those and downloads it into your container. And we'd never sort of like kick you to nine, but we think that saying you want the latest version of 1.8, sure there could be bugs, but realistically for most applications, what you want is the latest, safest uh, possible version of the JRE. Every time uh, Oracle posts a new version of Java, they immediately publish a bunch of CVEs for it. Um, and so if you fall one, two, three versions behind for some reason because you're picking a specific version, your JRE probably has 10, 20, 30 uh, CVEs against it, which are now public and um, exploitable against your application. So OpenJDK is probably the, um, the, the most obvious version. It's got this huge list of dependencies over, that we've sort of had um, added to over time. But almost all of these components go and download dependencies. You can configure any of the components that we're going to talk about, often the version that you actually want to go to, um, in a couple of different ways. The default configuration for the build pack, if you ever open it up, it's in a GitHub repository. It's called Java Build Pack in the Cloud Foundry org. Pretty easy to find. There's a config directory that has a bunch of YAML files. Uh, those YAML files correspond to sort of a convention-based name of an environment variable, and you can override them. So we see the example on the bottom, set end, we want to do JD, JVP, Java Build Pack, config, open JDK, JRE. There's a bunch of different configuration, if you remember from here. It's a bunch of stuff on the other side. So effectively what you're doing is you're defining uh, what they call a flow YAML style. So it's YAML but compressed down into a single line. Um, for anything that you want to override in there. In this particular case, we're saying we want to use the Java 9 JREs instead of the Java 8 JREs, which are now available and do work as of last Friday. Um, the other alternative to doing this style of configuration is you can actually do a build pack fork. Um, this used to be the only way to configure the build pack, and I don't know, about two years ago, we added this um, environment variable. Build pack forks still have a place. Um, you would effectively um, go to GitHub, create a new version, a fork of that build pack, make the changes that you want and, and absorb those changes in. And it's really good if you want to change some sort of default for everyone in your company. So if you're still people who are working against Java 7 or you have a specific version of the App Dynamics agent that you want everybody to be running against, you can make changes like that that go into the build pack that everybody uses. It makes it so not every single application has to configure something. Yeah, so the question is, we're setting an environment, and that environment shows up both during staging time and during um, uh, run time. Let's say that the uh, Cloud Foundry API makes this possible. Um, but for, trouble, and, uh, for troubleshooting reasons, I'm not sure it's a great idea to actually differentiate those two. Um, so even if you could write a tool that, that did do this for your users, um, the idea that it looks a little bit different during staging time than it looks when it's at runtime generally causes more confusion than it actually benefits. I understand like sort of wanting a cleaner environment, but sometimes it's really useful to be able to reason at runtime how this thing was staged. Like which version of the JRE is actually in there? Is it the one that the build pack chose or some environment change? Uh, and so we generally say, just let it go. Um, if you really, really care, you can use the, the CAPI API to actually make a change only during staging and not during runtime. Cool. So, <clears throat> the first kind of component uh, that gets involved inside of the build pack is the JRE. So the JRE uh, components, and there are four of them today. There's one for OpenJDK, one for Oracle, one for IBM, one for Azul. You'll hear me say this multiple times. If you have another one that you really, really like, let me know. GitHub issues, pull requests, things like that. We're happy to add these if you have other JREs you want to take a look at. <clears throat> these are responsible for contributing a JRE, not a JDK. It's a 
important technical difference, to the file system of your application. We specifically go with JREs, not JDKs, not only for the size difference, it's like 40 megs for a JRE and 140 megs for a JDK, um, but also because at runtime, <laughs> We have done a lot of work to guarantee there are no compilers on the file system anyway. Adding the JDK, which is another compiler during staging your application, just ripe for exploit at that point. So we want to make sure that we put a JRE on there. And most of these JRE implementations, in fact, all of these, also contribute something we call a memory calculator. And this gets to single-handedly <laughs> the most important bit of the Java build pack, in my opinion. The Java memory calculator uh, takes care of five memory regions. Uh, I'd ask you now uh, how many of you knew there were five memory regions. Um, I suspect most of you would say, yeah, yeah, I knew that. Most people don't, right? Um, I will tell you years ago when I started working on the Java build pack, I had no idea that there were five memory regions. They are the heap and metaspace, which everybody knows about. Some people probably realize that threads have some sort of memory footprint as well. It's the size of the stack, which you set with dash XS, S. Uh, times the number of threads that you're going to open, plus there's a little bit of fudge for system threads and things like that. Direct memory, something that's completely unbounded inside of a container that is bounded. And the code cache, the one that no one knows about. Where does the JIT put all the stuff that it's off compiling? And so if you take a look at some of the defaults of these things, like, uh, so heap doesn't have a maximum size, metaspace is unbounded as well, thread stacks are one meg times who knows, you can basically create as many threads as you want. Direct memory is completely unbounded. Code cache starts at 240 megs by default in Java 8. You start realizing that trying to wedge one of these things into a container is not what you actually thought it was. So many people think, oh, I can start, I can start a Spring Boot application in 32 megs. Well, maybe 32 megs a heap. <laughs> but what happens when Tomcat's default 200 thread thread pool gets into place? Well, there's another 200. The 240 for the default code cache, direct memory, we sort of bound it at 10 megs, but you're gonna have to pick some number if you use direct memory and Netty or something like that. We do some interesting calculations on Metaspace and stuff like that, and now all of a sudden you realize that trying to wedge a JVM into a container in such a way that it will never exceed the container's size is non-trivial. And it's certainly not something you ever want to try to do yourself. It's really, really hard. We've had um, many, many people working on this particular problem, this memory calculator, and doing a lot of sort of statistical analysis and things like that. So the JVM memory calculator, as a version four of the Java build pack, which if you're not using, please everybody start using. The very first line of execution, and you can actually see it sort of in the command that we build, kicks out exactly what Java memory uh, configuration we are going to set. So this is, I suspect, a standard gig um, container. Yeah, it looks about right. So you get about 360, let's call it 350 megs of heap. You get 116 megs, or sorry, yeah, 116 megs of metaspace. Reserve code cache is its default. We've picked some sort of bounded size and standard um, stack size. The formulas we use to calculate the things that don't have defaults are experimentally derived. Um, I'm happy to expose this, you know, how we came up with these numbers to anybody who cares. Suffice to say that we feel pretty good that they're gonna cover most applications, but we absolutely believe that there are applications that have very uh, different memory usage profiles that will need some sort of configuration that we can't handle. We change them lightly, 10 megs here, 20 megs there in the past, but Suffice to say, we feel pretty good that most applications will run without any sort of memory modification. One of the really cool things, though, um, in this memory calculator is we sort of calculate the constant overhead. Everything except heap, like the meta space, the direct memory, the reserve code cache, the thread stacks. Um, and that's sort of a fixed number. For the same application, the amount of sort of overhead memory will never, ever change, which means that if you find yourself running out of heap, all you need to do is scale the size of your container. If you go from a one gig container to a two gig container, the only number that changes up there is that heap that goes from uh, 350 megs to 1.3 gigs instead, right? You should always change the container size, right? The container, in the end, Diego and garden underneath the hood is a thing that looks at the current memory usage of the Java process, and the second it steps over your container size, that's it. 
it's over, right? So you can technically set dash XMX. Um, you are allowed to do that. But if you do that, and it means that the JVM uses too much memory, it, it, you're going to get killed, right? There's no good reason to ever change that number. What you do is you scale the container knowing that the overhead, like the meta space and stuff like that, will always stay the same. And if you need more heap, add a larger container means all the change goes into the heap. If you realize that you don't need so much heap, you can shrink it down, make it something smaller. Um, we're good about if you have chosen a container size that is smaller than the minimum calculated value, we're not going to start the container. We immediately throw an error and say, hey, uh, the minimum amount is about 600 megs. You've got a 512 meg container. You're going to need to make some changes, whether that's shrinking stack size or shrinking the number of threads that you could possibly use. The whole goal of the memory calculator. Yeah. The heap size is calculated. Right? You shouldn't do it because it's only a matter of time until you forget to do both of them in sync. We will automatically calculate the largest possible heap we can give you inside of the container, given everything else. Yeah. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. Um, we, we have a go. If you think there is something going on where you don't think we've covered some memory space or you don't think we're calculating it properly, you have you know, sort of a typical application that you think is, is busting some limit, give us a yell and we'll add it to the, it, we'll add it to the memory calculator. We'll examine what, you know, sort of how often we see other people using it, things like that, making sure that we get everything we want. Yeah. Right. Um, so a lot of people. Right. Uh, so the previous version of the build pack and other places, I don't believe accurately account for the amount of memory that JVMs actually use. We used to be bad at it. We're better at it now. But. Right, so all you need to do is change the JVM's calculation, right? So like we assume sort of like 300 threads because Tomcat has 300 threads and the, stack, the default stack size for those 300 threads is one meg. So if you know that you're gonna use a lot fewer threads because you're using something like Netty, right, which only has four threads or eight threads, change the number of threads, right, in our configuration. If you know that your stacks don't need a full meg, and I don't believe any, like any modern application actually needs meg of stack. You can set it to 256K or 512K, and the calculator will do what it's supposed to do and give you all of that back. Uh, based on uh, uh, You don't have to do it in JSON. You can literally do like a CF set end Java ops and pass in max metaspace size, pass in XSS with, as a Java opt. So you use the standard JVM flags to configure memory, and the memory calculator looks at those and compensates for your choices there. Same thing goes like no one realizes that in Java 8 there's this 240 meg block that the JIT uses, right? Everybody thinks they can go small, but there's a, there's a fair amount of documentation on the internet that in Java 8, um, because of the way tiered compilation works, going even from 240 megs down to 100 megs has like significant performance problems, right? So we just stick with the default there. If you think your, your application only needs 100 megs or only needs 50 megs of JIT space, then absolutely change it and we'll compensate in the calculation for it. Yeah. <clears throat> so the second kind of component inside of the build pack are containers. And containers are the execution engine. And it can be a bit misleading to talk about it in this way because they're responsible for gluing everything together and building the command line. And there are a bunch of them, but they don't necessarily mean containers. They certainly don't mean containers in like the Docker sense, um, but they don't also mean containers in the Tomcat sense either. We have, for example, the Java main container. It's by far our most preferred container. Um, we expect you to, you know, if you push an application that has a start class design, uh, defined, um, we will basically run it with java-jar, the name of your class, making sure all the class path is right, things like that. We love this because you actually provide and configure the runtime yourself. We have a Tomcat container. 
Um, it's probably the second most often used because so many people push wars. Um, it's great. <laughs> it's sort of a tuned Tomcat, but if you don't like the way we have tuned Tomcat to work inside our container, you're not gonna like any of the configuration styles. We absolutely recommend some sort of embedded container system for modern cloud-native applications. Bring your container with you, configure it the way you want to configure it. Don't depend on the build pack to do something like that. Spring Boot is one choice, like Drop Wizard would be another choice, Rat Pack is a choice, Play Framework is a choice, almost anything else, just don't bring a war. You'll see a bunch of Spring people wearing t-shirts that say, make jar, not war, right? Absolutely. Um, when, I, when I went over four years ago, I basically became a Ruby developer on a day-to-day -day basis, um, and it gave me this fresh perspective where I realized, like, the Java ecosystem, we screwed this up. We never should have had this idea of a shared container with a bunch of applications running inside of it. I understand why the decision was made, but the truth has always been the best way to do this is to carry your runtime with you, right? Guarantee that it is configured exactly the same way in development, in QA, in production, solves a huge class of configuration problems, and guarantees that everything works for you. <laughs> Uh, so there's also a disk zip container, um, the output format for Gradle applications, and there are a bunch of things like Rat Pack, for example, to build on top of it. I'm gonna rush through a couple of these, unfortunately. So frameworks are the other integrations with the build pack, and they, this encompasses almost everything else, whether it's APM agents or um, security providers or debuggers or anything like that, you're gonna find this huge list if you go to the Java build pack of the 27, and we probably add a new one once every month or two kind of thing, different integrations. So the most common use of a framework is a, a integration with a framework uh, sorry, integration with a service with zero configuration. What we want is for you to be able to bind a service, so bind a new relic service, for example, and that declaration of intent is the only thing you need to do. You do not need to write in your code or any integration with the build pack in order to make sure that new relic integrates with your application at runtime. So for example, we have a new relic APM service. It detects a, ser a single service. Um, we sort of filter out ambiguity and won't do anything automatically if there's any ambiguity. It has new relic as a substring, it goes off, it downloads a version of that agent. We add all the system properties extracted from the credential payload. So for example, the new relic um, service payload contains a license key and we need to make sure that the license key is properly configured inside of the new Relic agent. So when you start the application, it just starts sending data. We've automatically configured this whole thing and it sends data. I will show you, since there are already people coming in for the next one, I will show you after this. <laughs> we have a container security provider that detects the existence of Diego's new instance identity, where a cryptographic identity, a private key and a certificate are, print, are put into every single container and rotated often, hourly, daily, monthly, weekly, whatever number you want to choose. We make sure that we get a new version of the security provider. We configure all the things that are supposed to be configured so when your application comes up transparently, there's a new security provider. Maybe you use an HSM like Luna or Dyadic or Protect App or Cavium or something like that. We do the same thing. We get the latest version, we put it on the file system so your applications never actually know that this kind of stuff is happening. It just starts up transparently configured for you. We also have a couple like the debugger. Debugging inside of containers has always been a giant problem. So now you can simply configure the debugger to be enabled. And if you do that, we start the debugger up with all of the proper flags on it. You use the CFSSH command to put an encrypted tunnel between you and the container, and you run your debugger against it like you always would. And debuggers are great, but we can do it with profilers as well. You can do it with J, uh, uh, J Visual VM, right, to do JMX kind of things. All of this is now possible, and again, this is just a set of frameworks that have the ability to change the file system or change the command line, and change the command line. So now you know how, right? This build pack goes through these three phases. Should I make a change? Let me modify the file system. Let me create a command line. And because we have th control of all three of these things, and because we have this componentized model, you can add to it yourself, right? So uh, we have a number of forks 
uh, of the build pack where people have gone in and added, I have internal service X, and I want to integrate with that in the same way, the same transparent way. I have an internal metrics gatherer or something like that. Uh, and so there are, there's a publicly supported API that you add things to there. Um, if you find that you're integrating something like an APM we don't have that's broadly useful, please submit it back or at least just open an issue where we add these things on demand all the time. <coughs> uh, yeah. Right. So that's it. I apologize for running over to the next person. Um, rather than do Q&A here, obviously, let's do Q&A outside in the hallway <laughs> so we can let the, the next group of people in um, for this. And thank you.